Revolution Pod Squad. Welcome to Crafting a Revolution, the podcast. My name is Katie Freeman, and I'm your host. Every Wednesday and Friday, I bring you interviews of female and non-binary makers of all kinds from all over the world. Today's guests, there's an S at the end of that, um, are Stacy and Eleanor of the Ladies Who Would. Would be W O O D. Um, I came across them because something that um, Katie Thompson of Women of Woodworking shared out in an email blast. And I was like, okay, that is a pretty funny name. So I got to go check that out. So we're going to start with today's episode with the two of them together. And then in a week or so, I will be following up with the individual episodes with each of them, one with Stacy, one with Eleanor, um, because they are both makers and sculptors and furniture makers in their own right. And so I want to talk to them individually about their own journeys, but this was more of, you know, what is the ladies who would and uh, what is their collaboration all about? So I had a great time chatting with them and I think you're gonna really enjoy this episode as well. Uh, before we hop in with Stacy and Eleanor, though, I want to give a big shout out to the Pod Squad over on Patreon. So thank you so much, Annette at 513 Woodworks, Katie Thompson, Women of Woodworking, Kevin, Lefty's Workshop, Christy, Twisted Twine, Jeremy, Jeremy Spies, Sammy, Go Sammy Lee, Sven, Dwarf Size Workshop, Rachel, Moody Makes, Bonnie, Tool Mom Bonnie, ToolMomStore.com, Laura, Oakley Soap Company, Mary Lou, Made by Mary Lou, Brandy, Studio Obey, Lee, The Rainbow Carver, Ellen, Little Bear Furniture, and Ethan, Ethan Carter Designs. Thank you also very much for your continued and ongoing support, helping me to produce two episodes a week, every week. If you out there, listener, would like to get added to the list of the Pod Squad's names that get read off at the start of every episode every week. You certainly can do that by heading on over to patreon.com forward slash crafting a revolution and look at all the different tier options over there and join up over there. So I hope to see many of you over so I can spout off a whole bunch more names. I would love to like He's saying like 50 names every time. So you can go check that out. Again, patreon.com forward slash crafting a revolution. All right, let's head on into the episode with the ladies who would. Um, so I like to start by having my guests introduce themselves. So would you both do that for me? Can I go first? You can go. Okay. Um, I'm Stacy Mott. I'm an artist and I work primarily in wood and metal and I collaborate with Eleanor. Um, I'm Eleanor yeah. Rose. Um, yeah, I'm a craft-based sculpture artist and together we are ladies who would. That's true. Awesome. I love that name. So I have to start with asking, how did you come up with it? <laughs> I, that. I think, it, I don't know. We were joking with a friend of ours um, when we were still in grad school about starting a YouTube channel because she always hung out in our studio. And I guess we, I don't know, we have some banter, I guess. Um, and yeah, we were joking about titles and I think that just came up naturally. Yeah, it was like, yeah, I think it just started as an inside joke. With, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when we decided we were actually gonna do this collaboration because it had been something we'd discuss, been discussing for years now, um, it seemed like the right title. And we also thought it would grow over time and hope still that it will, so yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Whereabouts in the country are you guys located at? We are in Indiana, Pennsylvania. In, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm here, California, Pennsylvania, Washington, Pennsylvania. Edinburgh. What else? Edinburgh, Pennsylvania. So oh, the message I'm getting here is Pennsylvania cannot pick their own names for. <laughs> no, they're big fans of everywhere else. Yeah. I love it. I love yeah. it. Um, Okay. I can say I've never been there. Um, yeah. <laughs> so what brought you, what brought you there? 
Uh, we came as resident artists because there is a wood program here and BA Harrington invited us. And because of COVID, it's usually a semester long thing, but we're here for two years, which is awesome. So we're teaching um, and making our own work. Okay, all right. So again, I'm gonna have you both on individually, but I think it would be beneficial to just have an understanding like what is your own work like individually and then collaborative yeah I mean Eleanor's got more of a side hustle than I do our our collaborative work is how would you describe it I mean it's sculpture um based it's in definitely not craft usable. it's yeah we make completely useless furniture that does things you wouldn't expect I guess um or looks like it's something it's not or yeah it's mostly furniture based but we're branching out more and more um yeah yeah and then I uh run my little tool business um where I make woodworking tools and yeah yeah make know. it like hand tools like planes and yeah planes and hammers and mallets and spoke shaves and that kind of thing okay mm -hmm. um see I, I'm, I'm having to stop myself i so want to dive into individual stories stop <laughs> okay. <laughs> um okay so did had you both worked together at all before doing this residency kind of i mean we met what seven years ago now something like that. Yeah, we've been working alongside each other all the time. And, and I think like when we first met, there was just this like kind of cool like maker chemistry, I guess I would call it. I mean, we just talked endlessly about what we could make together if we ever collaborated and the things we were interested in. And we just had- When we were just sharing ideas. studios the whole yeah. time, we've never mm -hmm. not had a- a space, a space, a separate space, separate yeah. Space, yeah. Yeah. So, and then, you know, in grad school, we kind of realized more and more that this was something we wanted to do, but that's not, I mean, when you enter grad school as an individual maker, it's not really the right time to say, guess what? I'm part of a duo. So, um, that was the plan when we left, was we immediately start working on this kind of, you know, huge kind of collection of ideas that we put together. Yeah. Okay. So, where'd you guys go to grad school at? UW Madison. Okay. I was suspecting since you said Sylvie was a friend, but um, I didn't want to completely say that that was, that was, um, so did you uh, go for sculpture or furniture or both? We went for woodworking. Yeah. For, I mean, it's a furniture woodworking program, um, but it's really open. You can, I mean, when you get there, everyone in every department can pretty much do whatever they want. Um, but yeah, we were looking specifically for wood programs because we knew we wanted access to a you know complete wood shop like we wanted access to not a sculpture shop where everything would be shared and there probably wouldn't be hand tools and well, sculpture shops just don't have the same kind of tools or like precision like, tools, yeah, or... Precision tools and, um... so I, I i definitely need to ask then can you say more about that i guess i'm not familiar um on the academic side like the difference between those two spaces I mean, sculpture shops are like tend to be used as like you can use two by fours and wet wood on the joiner, and you can kind of just mm. it's like kind of free for all a little bit. And it's like, oh, do you want to put foam through your planer? Great. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's two slits, and they're definitely out of square, and that's okay. Yeah, <laughs> that um, kind of thing. Yeah, and like that's fine for when you're working that way, but when you're trying to like build furniture, build furniture, yeah, yeah, precision is so important in um, traditional furniture making. And we just, we were pretty sure that's what we wanted to do. And so we thought it was really important to go to a place that could allow us to do that. Yeah, yeah and, and there aren't that many Yeah, and UW was one of like five in yeah. the United States. So. Yeah, that also provided full funding, which was something that we were absolutely, you know, uh, that was that was a, a deal breaker if we weren't fully funded, so. Mm -hmm. And is that the first place you both met or? Do you have... No, we met in San Francisco and we were both living there. Okay. Yeah, okay. I was Stacy's boss at, yeah. at, a, at CCA while she was still a student. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so does, is that the background then? Did you get uh, like sculptural, do you both have sculptural background coming into furniture? Um, I, have a, I have a degree in sculpture. Um, okay. Yeah. No, I have a degree in photography and furniture design. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so I did traditional furniture design and making training. That was, yeah, it was like a furniture program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So your journey starts in kind of the grad school realm. What were some of the things you started talking about making together? I mean, everything was supposed to be funny. I know we had a lot of ideas where we're like, that's going to be hilarious. Um, I can't remember what, but it was a lot of like, oh, a cabinet that's going to set itself on fire when someone opened the door or yeah, I don't even know. We just wanted to do something really funny. I don't think we're making funny work right now. I know. <laughs> um, no, I mean, like, our, yeah, we were like constantly talking and then like, like I came out in grad school um, and, and then like our kind of ideas of like femininity, like overt femininity kind of like aligned. And so we started making a little more serious stuff, but like we have all this stuff written down and like we're hoping to do it eventually. Yeah, we have a book of them. Yeah, there was this, I mean, I was, before we were working together, I was making all this work about hygiene as, um, and you know, the female body and mm -hmm. the kind of class and race and gendered kind of um, understandings of hygiene. And Eleanor, when she transitioned was like, I'm gonna buy pink frilly things. And I was like, oh my God, you can't do that. No one will take you seriously. <laughs> like, yes, they will. And yes, they will. And, and so that became this kind of moment where, you know, like her, her understanding of femininity and mine, um, became this kind of talking point and something that really guided the way that we thought about the work we wanted to make. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess I just really would love if you dive into that more. Like, what does that mean? <laughs> um, so the work that we are, the stuff we're doing now is one of the things that we were thinking about is like, what is something that is aggressively feminine? Like, what does that look like if it's not pink and frilly because that's infantilized. Like, how can we get at that? And then we were also looking at um, historical craft and looking for instances where women were um, absolutely a part of the making experience. They were there, they were contributing in these really meaningful ways, but, but they, they were, were anonymous. Mean, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. and so we- We were both doing that research in grad school on our, in our like academic seminar kind of classes. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, and so then we ended up, we decided we were going to do this whole series where we were looking at different crafts. We were going to do a textile piece and a, you know, something with like a William Morris wallpaper, but we started with ceramics and then just got really obsessed with it. And so we just keep making pieces in response to Wedgwood ceramics. Um, not because there's anything wrong with Wedgwood. It's just the only, it's the oldest company that's still producing. And so there's a lot of stuff out there. Um, yeah, there's a lot making, of documentation about yeah, the women yeah. not being the women involved in much uh, work. Yeah, it started in the, the work. Yeah, yeah, it started in the 1790s. They're still producing. And since we knew we needed to buy some ceramics, we were like, oh, well, we can buy the stuff from the 80s that no one wants and use that. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, does that explain it? I don't even know. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, it definitely does. Um, kind of explains the, the thought path there. Um, and I'm just thinking, I mean, that's obviously not something that is unique to this craft industry. Um, you know, I've had on the podcast um, a couple, oh, I cannot think of the proper ter term for it right now, but they make violins. Um, and yeah. Yeah. thank you, Luthier. <laughs> it was escaping me. But, you know, they, uh, similar things, right? Like women have been making uh, musical instruments for hundreds of years. Um, but they were forced to like sell it under their husband's name mm -hmm. or, you know, whatever man was allowed to like own the business. And so then they were erased. And so even trying to find history of like the women actually doing it is really hard. Yeah. To find that. Yeah. I mean, that's why Wedgwood was such a good choice because yeah, there are so many, um, you know, PhD yeah. theses and, you know, so much academic yeah, writing actually, like, on the history, like the gender history. Yeah. yeah. And it, yeah, you're right. It's not unique. And coming from a furniture background, we were thinking a lot about furniture that's designed for women and what that implies about what they should be doing with their lives and with their days mm. and, you know, their, their kind of role in the domestic sphere. And so I thought, yeah, I think pairing those two things was interesting to us too. Yeah, because so so little furniture, at least, you know, in the past was designed for and made by women. Um, yeah. yeah. Hey, makers, today's episode is sponsored in part by toolmomstore.com. At toolmomstore.com, you can find 
any and all tool-based merchandise for all genders, all sizes. They've got mugs, they've got shirts, all kinds of cool stuff. I have uh, one of the shirts myself that has the uh, hashtag woodworker on it. And I also have a couple of the mugs that define what and who is a tool chick. So super excited with the merchandise that I have. I know that you will be satisfied as well. Um, and also great discount for those of you who listen to the podcast at checkout. If you enter the code maker mom, you will get a 20% discount off any of the merchandise that you buy. So that's just toolmomstore.com. All right, let's head back into the action. Yeah, that's really, in, I heard a, a, a fact recently that this idea of women's work being domestic work was actually not even in part of any kind of written history until the industrial revolution, where it was like, well, we have to define this because men are defined as going off to work outside of the home. So therefore, if men leave the home, then women have to stay home. Um, yes. <laughs> and then the devaluing of that labor too begins and it, or yes. not, but then it's, yeah, it's on this trajectory where it's defined differently. And yeah. Yeah, one of the things we found that the second piece we made was based on these cabinets we found called um, Bonheur du Jour, which are these, it translates as daytime delight, which we thought was funny. <laughs> uh, but then they're, they're for, you know, women of a particular class, like, you know, women with money and probably a lot of time on their hands, but it's a tiny little cabinet where they're supposed to eat their breakfast there and do their hair there and write letters. And basically the only space she's allowed to occupy is this little tiny desk. <laughs> Which we thought was so amazing. We're like, okay, even a wealthy white, like she's definitely a white woman, yes. <laughs> um, is is confined to this tiny space within her home um, to do whatever nonsense she's expected yeah, to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Um, I wonder too. You know, with that, I guess change being recorded with the start of uh, industrial revolution, if it plays into fact to things like furniture started to get made in factories right like before that everything was made by hand and generally could somebody at home may have been the person who was making it it was something that was not looked at as something you went to the store and bought like it was mm -hmm. you know made so I wonder too if that's where it became more transitioned into a men's job you know men's work <laughs> it transferred into the factory yeah I mean I wonder like that before the industrial revolution there would have been apprentice apprentices right working right. for um men who were then passing on the trade in, in a variety of ways yeah I don't know I mean there's there is you know a history of women being taught to young women being taught to paint the decorative you know portions of furniture to do these little scenes um, and that happened in Wedgwood too the first kind of what Oh, the first notable involvement or recorded involvement of um, a woman was that she was invited to draw the draw or draw the, the scenes that would be on this particular pottery jasper ware. Um, but she wasn't designing anything. She wasn't allowed to do anything more than draw these sweet little, you know, scenes of like nymphs and I don't know what cherubs and things. <laughs> <laughs> so it was still kind of dictated what she was going to have to create. Yeah, like her level of participation was limited. And then there are these stories too of women who were in the factories, in the potteries, um, and their whole job was to keep the wheels spinning for the, the throwers. Like they weren't allowed to throw. It was considered, you know, they were um, uh, not talented enough, I they guess. They were to the do motors. That. They were the motors. They were the motors for the throwing <laughs> wheels, which is just hilarious. I mean, obviously, like if we're talking about physical strength, surely a man should be doing that and a woman should be throwing. <laughs> So I'm curious, like, how would you guys even, I mean, was it a matter of stumbling across this information, like finding all of this history? I mean, I had done a bunch of research. I was, I, I got really obsessed with Sussex chairs, which mm. were made by um, William Morris and got kind of obsessed with that history. And then it was like, I got into the wallpaper and I was wife, like did most of the painting and the textile work. And then that was just kind of pulled over into the wallpapers. And I was like, oh, okay. So it's just theft from his daughter and wives, <laughs> their wife and daughters. And yeah, it was just, um, yeah, that helped in the conversation, I think. Cause we did start, our first thought was like, okay, well, we're gonna 
tackle Morris stuff. Yeah. Um, I mean, also, yeah, I mean, I, well, I'll speak for myself. Like, I'm not a designer. If I'm confronted with, you know, build a piece of furniture, I'm going to go looking in the past to see, like, what do I want to reference and why? Um, and so a lot of that ends up becoming, you know, like, why, why this piece? What am I interested in about it? What period does it come from? And what do I know about that era that is important if I'm going to be remaking this or making a version of this? Um, so I think it's, you know, it's really important. Like, there's a whole history of you know, really skilled craftspeople making fine furniture who were also enslaved in this country, yep. you know? Um, and so I think you have to, as, as a non-designer and someone who's, you know, talking about this history, um, it just kind of, kind of comes with the territory. So this may seem, this may seem like a dumb question, but how do you find that history? Like, I'm asking legitimately for myself oh, because yeah. I, mean, I know like I do the same thing, right? I'm like, okay, I'm inspired by this, this design style. I want to learn more about it. And usually all I can find is like the white European history about it. And I'm like, that doesn't feel like that's the full story. <laughs> this thing. There's, there's this amazing Instagram called, what is it? Black People Craft DA. And it goes and it talks about historical black makers. Um, and then also, I mean, I don't know what I'll do when I don't have access to any more, this anymore, but JSTOR has been an amazing place for me to find, you know, academic research on this. Um, and then there's, I'm a total podcast junkie. There's this podcast I listen to with two journalists who talk about their research a lot. And they always mention Google Scholar, which I had never heard about. <laughs> Yeah, like, I've never heard oh, I don't have access to JSTOR. I'm gonna have to figure out this Google Scholar thing because it seems to, you know, filter out the clickbait and the whatever, you know, the, yeah. Yeah, yes. the same thing that you always get. I mean, I think we're always gonna have JSTOR because we've, neither, yeah, I mean, <laughs> through the entire time of knowing each other, one of us has always had some sort of academic mm -hmm. job. Um, yeah. Which we so. hope to maintain, yeah, because I don't know how <laughs> we're gonna pay for any of this. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think, because that's really important and having especially women of color on the podcast a lot of times we get into that discussion you know women wanting to of color being like I want if you know a lot of the European styles that people continue to use don't have European roots no um, there's so they much were, information <laughs> yeah they were they were completely flat out stolen right from from other ethnicities and so um like trying to, I guess, bring that story forward through their work now, like, right, um, as being a woman of color who makes. So I think it's super important. Um, and I guess it's sad to me that some of that history has been lost. Yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot of people trying to recover that, you know, like in archives and stuff like the Milwaukee or Chipstone through the Milwaukee Museum did a really cool exhibi exhibition about an enslaved potter. Um, but he was signing his work. And I think that's why there's more known. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, there's, what else have we seen that's done a really good job? I mean, there's, what is his name? Robel Owake, is that his name? Yeah. Yeah, there's this um, contemporary maker who, I think he's mostly, he does metalsmithing and carpentry, but he was doing all this work on these little, these chairs that he saw when he was visiting Africa. Um, that a lot of white furniture makers make versions of. And I don't think anyone, I didn't know this until I saw his work that this is a traditional chair. It's, it's, it's an appropriated form and a lot of people make these little chairs. Um, yeah, I think even the, the recognition of the kind of deep roots of appropriation is something that many people are just kind of figuring out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, until... I don't want um, I don't want to say that we couldn't know this before the age of the internet but it was harder to know before the age of the internet um and so there there's a bit of like you know ignorance is bliss <laughs> like you don't know what you don't know and if even going to school uh, under these things right they're still being taught in a uh, a scholarly way that that these are European designs um, so even though you guys have access to some of that uh, research um, it's not always shared down into the the classroom 
world. No, yeah. it's really not. I mean, well, the no, way that even at UW there was still like talk of like, oh, you need to go learn from a you know European master, and it's like, oh God, <laughs> no. <laughs> well, these are the art history, the like fun foundation art history classes that everyone has to take are taught from a European lens, and there's very little discussion of appropriation. Very, yeah, and it's just, I mean, that that's. It's, it would be so easy to teach those classes differently. It would be so yes. easy. Um, but I remember, I mean, when I first went to school it was the early 2000s and I was studying anthropology and history. And I remember going to my first archive as a student, it was a labor archive and, and being taught like, this is how you research. You have to go look at old documents and you have to sift through them. And there are all these rules about what you can handle and how you can handle it. And I, it's so great. Like now I can't even imagine with COVID how anyone is doing that kind of research, you know? Right. <laughs> store and all these databases are such a gift mm -hmm. yeah um so i guess i want to follow some of that conversation up with a question i mean you both you know you say you're, you're teaching um so how do you carry some of that knowledge forward to your students well we have <laughs> weekly conversations about different artists that we put together for them to look at and we're trying really hard to make sure that they are a really diverse group and that they're making work that i think broadens the conversation that we can have with them you know that we're like, what do you think that this is about and um yeah if it's about imperialism do you understand what that means and um well yeah every semester we warn people about appropriation and try mm -hmm. to like right at the start and because that's I think something that is instantly done by young people, young artists who don't know. Trying to figure better. out, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, even, I mean, we just had the conversation on Wednesday with our class about why there is so little diversity in woodworking. We're like, why do you think that is? And they, of course, had no idea. And so we had to talk about, I mean, we talked about that. And, um, well, and here we are, two white ladies. Two white talking ladies about talking about it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was going to ask that. What's the, what is the makeup? of the students that you guys see? I mean, it's a really diverse campus, um, but our students this semester are mostly white. It's the woodworking. People are not, I think it's, you know, like the legacy of woodworking, is, you know, the old white dude in the yep. in his garage. And I think it's still, well, it's just not a, it's yet to be redefined as something yeah, for everyone or even, fun or even interesting. Just or, queer, through a queer lens, you don't want to really go into that kind of space or like mm -hmm. you don't feel safe in that space so you're not even going to look or sign up for the class although we do have a lot of queer students which is nice yeah no yeah. but I mean like yeah I mean our names aren't on the, any kind of list of faculty because we're guest lecturers so it's like mm -hmm. they're they're taking up a gamble on who's going to be the teacher mm -hmm. yeah I don't know well then even too I think the the amount of stuff that you have to have to be mm -hmm a furniture maker is yep. so overwhelming. Like that's why we keep trying to stay in academia. We're like, we will never have a shop. We will, you know, it's right. so expensive. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, I mean, even that's, that feels like, why would you take that on when you can go learn sculpture and, you know, work with found objects or casting or something? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's I mean, something we think about a lot Even too. casting is so expensive. Yeah, that's true. Um, We've been doing a lot of casting. It's real expensive. Um, um, I, mean, I, well, I was going to ask that too, even sculpture, any of the arts, um, how diverse do they get? It depends. I mean, we, yeah, I don't know. It's a good question. I mean, I do think it depends on the type. The, well, the type of art and then like where you are in the country. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. But sculpture's got a bad reputation reputation for bro culture too. Um, sculpture, I, mean, I think, I think blacksmithing, glass blowing, and wood are the bad ones. Yeah. You know? yeah, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I would say a bad reputation, but it still seems very fair reputation. You know, oh, an <laughs> earned <laughs> reputation. Yes. For sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if anything, like craft equity is showing us all that. Yeah, right? like, do you follow that account on Instagram? Uh uh craft yeah. equity yeah it's um it's anonymous people writing in about their experiences and in craft institutions um and it's revealing and it's not surprising and though. not just cra craft institutions just like Academia, make any kind making, of making yeah. institution um yeah i mean i think the hope is that spaces like maker spaces can start to open doors uh for people to get into you know craft uh just because it's a, a 
less barrier to entry cost wise. Um, but to your guys's point, when you talked about those, the <laughs> sculptural studio, that's kind of a maker space. Like, yeah, totally. there's not top end tools usually in a maker space. Um, because it's all shared equipment, right? And people are coming through and they might be cutting like a giant block of resin something. <laughs> you know? well, then yeah, and then those shop spaces don't want to like have a stare at sitting on the, in their yeah. tool cabinet, right? Because it'll get dropped in like exactly 10 seconds. Yep, <laughs> exactly. What we realized too is like teaching here and realizing and also learning more and more about the kind of barriers to entry, the financial barriers to entry in this field um has made us realize that yeah it's like it's the the i don't know implication that you need this really expensive and varied tool set to do these things is so pretentious <laughs> you know like can we teach with box cutters instead of like you know really expensive japanese knives yeah we can do that you know like there's a lot of substitution that can go on um and yeah well i'm i'm starting to teach um refurbishing classes through woo and mm -hmm. I think that's kind of like, I mean, that's how I've maintained a really large collection of hand tools for pretty cheap is just knowing how to like fix something up that's so ruined uh, or like ru quote unquote ruined yeah. or like it seems you know, unredeemable steampunk decor <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> to most people. Hey Pod Squad, today's episode is brought to you in part by the Empowered Makers Online Festival. What is that, you may be asking yourself? Well, the Empowered Makers Online Festival is a totally free, I'm going to pause there, totally free DIY party designed to inspire, empower, and educate so that you can stop that Pinterest scroll and be the powerhouse DIYing woman that you're totally capable of being. During this four-day online event, you'll hear exclusive presentations from 12 incredible women DIYers and craftswomen covering topics like beginner electrical work, how to flip furniture, making time for DIY, and so much more. If you're ready to stop just dreaming about DIY and start taking some big freaking action, join us over there from September 27th through 30th for the Empowered Makers Online Festival. Can't wait to see what you create after um, attending the event. You can register by going to empoweredmakers.com forward slash revolution. So again, that is empoweredmakers.com forward slash revolution. So free event, check 12 incredible women sharing um, you know, dropping knowledge bombs or sharing their stories, check awesome funness, getting to meet uh, more people in this space and make new friends, check, check, check. So go check it out, empoweredmakers.com forward slash revolution. And I can tell you that I am one of the 12 women who will be doing a presentation for this. And I share my story and talk about how to get past the fear of failure so you can get started on your projects. All right, with no further ado, let's hop back on into the episode. Um, well, and I think probably there's something to that behind why like the DIY movement uh, kind of is taking off, right? It's because it is showing people how you can use, you know, a circular saw from Home Depot. And if you know what you're doing, you can get pretty good results with yeah. that versus, you know, the uh, saw stop you know, cabinet, <laughs> um, table saw that all of us drool over and want someday, but it's, yeah. it's just much more affordable um, and you can still get there. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think that there's something to that. Um, and I find this, I guess, I wouldn't say it's a battle, but it feels like it sometimes through the podcast, when I get somebody on from academia versus somebody from DIY. <laughs> <laughs> um, and their thoughts about it, right? I, I see the benefit of both. I think the academia path um, uh, teaches a person to really look inward and really think through about design and why you're doing something. And I think there's benefit in that, absolutely. Um, the DIY side, though, I think can teach you the skills faster. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, 100%. Um, 
I mean, there's also like there, I think there's this preciousness, preciousness around protecting traditional craft. Like if it's not made in a particular way, we can't celebrate it as traditional craft, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I also, when I finished my program, like I chose photography and furniture because I was like, okay, I don't think that I will make it as an artist. And these are really practical things that I'm learning. And then I got out and I was like, I don't know how to do anything practical with this skill, <laughs> you know, like photography, fine. But furniture, I was like, what? I can't do anything with this. Like, I can't go be a carpenter. Well, I mean, you can't do anything because you don't have, you can't afford the tools. Well, that like, and also, yeah, I mean, and also like, what am I, spent? like I, yeah, it was just, it was a funny realization. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, without the yeah. the means to to do this, I am useless again. Yeah. <laughs> and I also didn't know Academia how- Academia world, the right? I mean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm really good at reflecting on my, my thoughts, but, um, and my ideas, but yeah, I can't do anything with them. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that's, um, I, it wasn't Sylvie, I'm trying to think of who it was, but that I had on recently that said a lot of times when you're in grad school, like in some type of art program, your professors are preaching to you, the track to go is to become like a tenured professor in art. Mm -hmm. And she's like, but how ridiculous is that? Because there's how many of us students year after year and how many tenured positions are there? Even yeah. if you add up all of the colleges, you know, universities across the entire state. So it would be nice if there was a little bit more taught <laughs> of like, what can you do with this? Yeah. Yeah. What else? Like, what can you do that with this? That's gonna like feed you after you graduate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that's certainly not sculpture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know there's this funny, like people, I think often think that tenured, that people become professors because they don't know how to make, or they're not making successfully. And it's like, no, no matter how successful you, unless you're a blue chip artist, which is, you know, vanishingly rare you all everyone has to have a job to do this and that's not yep. a designation of a lack of success it's just the reality of being a maker yeah yeah exactly I mean and that's again why I find you know a lot of people I have on who may come from the DIY world that is because they have found that they can make an actual living off of content creation like that is their job and they just so happen to also get to do this thing that they love making in order to make the content around that yeah um, you know is that the rare dream though like huh? many, is that the new rare dream the idea that everyone could do it and then it's like very few people actually make content make the the content that you know, that resonates. Yeah, that works. Yeah. I think it is the new dream. I mean, and I think I'm one of the people on the end going uh, after five years, I think I've called it quits. <laughs> no, don't do it. <laughs> this is we talking about how there's a need for like a queer, like female approach to podcasting and craft, you know, and then and we're like, we should do it. We should just do it. And then we got your invite. And we're like, oh my God, she's doing it. Wait, we know <laughs> the people she's interviewing. Oh my God. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a small niche though. You know, once you niche down to that, like queer well, woodworker, yeah. you've kind of gotten out of, uh, I mean, it's cool though. Like there yeah, are but there's so many, there's like, so many, so many like straight white men doing woodworking podcasts. It's like, I, I just can't listen to it anymore. Yeah, like, I, I know. Yeah. Well, there's also so many brilliant women doing really cool work. There's so many, you know, and like we all, we know all the people in academia because it's a small world and everyone knows each other. And like the DIY, and like there's very, there's rarely a bridge between this community and the DIY community or the crafting community mm -hmm. not trying to make art. And there really should be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's the, the broader message of what I try to get out with the podcast is just no matter what path you get to making making empowers you to yeah. do so many things and that's a um, share of empowerment too which yeah is really exactly <laughs> exactly but I think it comes down to uh, it comes down to no matter where we've all been socialized specifically as women to think that there's only two seats at the table of 10 for us and mm -hmm. so you know, the, the fine furniture maker and the DIYer have to duke it out because there's only so many chairs at the table. Um, instead of we can all make chairs, that's exactly, the thing. <laughs> exactly. Instead of realizing, wait, we can make more tables and more chairs. Yeah. Like that is a, a skill set we own. Um, you know, I, and I am just as guilty of finding myself sometimes in that mindset of like, oh, I'm competing against this person instead of like 
nope, we can both exist and both do well and be successful. Um, nobody's saying that that spot's only, there's only one spot. Mm -hmm. Are most of your guys' students male still? No, no. which is great. <laughs> yeah. Our sculpture class last semester was all women, which was really fun. I think they made work that they just wouldn't have if there had been um, even one, you know, one yeah, dude. It in felt the room. like a really, really safe space last semester. Yeah. Um, and then we have three men in our class this semester. Of, out they of 14, seem cool. Out of 14, no. So it's not like, yeah, overwhelming. No. Since you said that your names aren't like on the list, do you think the word has gotten out? about like it's you two who are teaching these classes <laughs> I don't know I think we might be a hit in the interior design department like we had a we've had a bunch of interior design students who have come to our classes at this point that we've yeah. really um jived with, jived with. and yeah. so yeah I don't know well I yeah we'll see we have an advanced class next semester that you know it's only students who have taken the intro class can take so we'll see if they all come back to us <laughs> you know that to me makes complete logical sense though and it makes complete logical sense that you're getting industrial uh, or interior design students because I've heard stories from people on this podcast being an interior design major, going to a woodworking class, and the male teacher basically, you know, just dismissing their ideas as nothing because they're just some foo foo, you know, design major. So I can imagine that they probably just by you being gendered female, feel comfortable walking into a space with the two of you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we hope so. <laughs> That's the goal. Yeah. <laughs> so I definitely don't want to like get anybody in trouble, but I'm curious with your experience of teaching and then working with male teachers <laughs> and how they teach. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've had, I've had male teachers be abusive um, kind of towards me as a trans woman. And, um, but then I've also like, I'm, I'm, I'm usually the go-to for like gender questioning or mm -hmm. gender fluid or non-binary yeah. students. Um, and they, they will come and be like, uh, such and such professor is not like gendering me right. Such mm -hmm. and such professor is, um, yeah, using my dead name or like it just it's um, and I think the problem is mostly like it's seventy year old white men yeah. who yeah. don't understand that they need to keep educating themselves and like I mean I think Stacy and I in the last two years were like okay like we we absolutely still need to educate ourselves and we're not 70. You know? Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. We don't have the wisdom of old age yet. <laughs> yeah, no, but I mean, but that that's, that's one of the beauties of this collaboration is that we can like, we keep each other like informed and on our toes and we read different things and like the algorithms are sending us each different articles to read mm -hmm. and like, yeah, it's just like, it's a nice to have like a sounding board and someone else who's like, maybe saw something that you didn't. And yeah, yeah, I don't know. I think that's one of the like- If, huge if you didn't have this wonderful collaboration between each other, would you feel lonely in that space? Yes. Yeah. yeah, this has been a very isolating time. I mean, it's a really conservative community that we're in. The students, I think, are not as conservative. Um, but with COVID, they have mostly haven't been here. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, it's, I mean, this has been a really good um, transitional thing for us because we both realize that we do not want to live in a rural conservative area ever again. <laughs> and we both have spent most of our lives in cities. So we didn't, we needed that lesson, um, which was good. Yeah. yeah. No, but I mean, it's also been like, as as kind of difficult as it has been, it's been a nice proving ground for our collaboration. Like, yeah, of course we fight. We're like roommates and- and <laughs> We spent and a lot of time we spent together. all of our time <laughs> together. Um, and yeah, when we spent all of quarantine together and, um, but yeah, it was a nice like kind of proving ground. It's like, okay, like, so we'll fight, but we won't like kill each other, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, and also to test our approach to teaching here to students who maybe wouldn't, you know, we, we were concerned they wouldn't be receptive to the weird things we're asking them to do, the artists we're asking them to look at. And that hasn't been the case at all, which is really exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So where does the women who would go from here? <laughs> I mean, the dream is to have our own little space somewhere and to start opening it up for, you know, free lessons. Like, can we do an apprenticeship type of program? Can we, you know, can Eleanor's tool refurbishing um, lessons be something that we can just offer to people? I don't know. I mean, we have a lot of people too that we would love to collaborate with. Yeah. Yeah, we're just kind of waiting to see. I mean, we've, we've established it as a thing now and we're, you know, making this work that we're really excited about so yeah yeah I don't know we I mean we know we want to move back to the city so or like, city, somewhere somewhere yeah like <laughs> any, so any city um, <laughs> or yeah just outside four people yeah. got it yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah lots of people yeah um, we, just, we just visited Covington we're like oh it's like right outside of uh Cincinnati, Cincinnati and like this is an adorable little town yeah. we can live there um but yeah I don't know I think we both still, we both really do love teaching. So yeah. if we can. Like, well, and co-teaching, which people just don't do. Yeah. It's really crazy to me that more people don't do this. It's so much fun. Yes, it's half the pay, but it's like, you know, when, when students maybe don't jive with me, they probably do with Eleanor and right. you know, such diverse skill sets and ideas about the world and experiences that we can bring all of that to the table, yeah. which is just awesome. Well, and Stacey and I are like, polar and how we do things pretty much like we are we are opposites which I think is what makes the collaboration so fun like I, I keep saying she's the smart one I'm the brave one um which is not not true not that neither of us have those other qualities but like Stacy is definitely more book learned than I am and I'm like I don't know let's cut the chair in half and then like run to the bandsaw um yeah I don't know have you guys uh, considered um, getting into the world of virtual classes so that no matter where you're at and located, you can always uh, provide those classes? I've taught one so far. I have another one in a month. I don't know, two months, two months. Yeah. yeah, Eleanor's classes with Wu have been good for us to see what's possible and like they, you know, because they've done so much work to streamline the process and make sure the content is really viable um and so yeah it was you know like we don't have any experience filming stuff or making content and so it's good to you know have Elnor be doing this this and figuring a lot of it out through them yeah well and it's yeah it's such a like what can I actually get away with what will people be able to follow along and do because mm -hmm. that's that's the main thing it's like I yeah after 15 years of doing this I have the tool collection I have the machine collection to do certain things that I right. needed for my work and I'm lucky enough to be in that position, but like it's it's really about like tailoring to a smaller tool set and, yeah. and like beginner skill set because I mean I'm I'm still kind of bad at that. I'm like I don't know. It's like you feel it in your right. bones. You know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like tell you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You can't you can't hear that. It's yeah. uh, sick. <laughs> the table saw is sick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Eleanor is a whiz at machines. It's really disturbing. Yeah, I, I tend to understand machines yeah. more than I understand she human beings. To but, them. Um, I need you to come visit my shop then and take care of all of my equipment. Um, <laughs> I, love too. Yeah. I love that. No, it's great. This is, yeah, this is the collaborator you need. Yeah. Hey, makers. So today's podcast episode is sponsored in part by Alicia Van Osdahl, who is the owner of Basil Blue Design Company. Alicia is a maker of all things, really. Her focus is on beautiful craftsmanship through woodworking, repurposing, refinishing art and sculpture. Her background includes 30 years of graphic design, logos, and branding. If you have an idea or concept that and need a creative solution or graphic design, you can email Alicia directly at Alicia, and that is A L I C I A at basilblue.com. Or you can visit her website at www.basilblue.com. And fun fact uh, Alicia actually designed the logo for Crafting a Revolution. So that is an example of the impeccable work you can expect 
if that is something you are in the market for. So be sure to look up Alicia again at her website, basilblue.com. All right, let's get back into the action. Yeah, um, I mean, because I just uh, started doing virtual classes through Teachable. So they're, you know, always available, always up for sale. Um, my first one, I probably shouldn't count it out yet, but, you know, very low sales, but still it was that same thing. I started with finishing because I figured that was like an easier transferable skill and not one surprisingly enough that a lot of people talk about. Um, and especially not outside of just your like lacquer and poly and oil. And it's like, oh no, we can do so many other things with it. Yeah. Um, so I started there and then I, I'm in the works of working on my intro to power carving one. And it's the same thing though, of like, my fear is like with the power carving one, I'm like, but you have to buy tools. Like you have to be able to afford a certain level of tools mm -hmm. for this class to even make sense. <laughs> like, um, but the benefit there is people can buy the class even if they don't have the tools yet. And then the class can usually be a cost of like, it wasn't too bad that they can decide, is this really something they think they would be interested in mm -hmm. before yeah. they buy the tool? And then it's always available for them to like go back through it. Um, but yeah, I totally could see your, like your plain restoration thing being a big, I would take that class. Cause I, <laughs> I've inherited quite a few planes from uh, my father-in-law who had who's passed away quite a few years ago and you know my mother-in-law is still like well you're the woodworker you need to have all of these things and and it's like that's great but I have no idea how to restore them so they're sitting in a box uh not getting used you know and it just makes me feel sad <laughs> yeah I mean there's plenty of tools in the world we don't need to be buying and this is like coming from a tool maker who's like buy, <laughs> brand new buy tools. my tools but um <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there, like, there's no need to like buy, go out and buy like Veritas planes. Like, you don't need every Veritas plane. Like, um, you don't. You can find all of those things that are, you know, a hundred something years old, and they're still just right. as good. Well, Eleanor um, is also really good at finding things on eBay for very cheap um, yeah. that look like they can't be repaired, and that she knows what to look for. So, like, even sharing that knowledge so people don't, yeah. you know, get scammed or buy stuff yeah. that can't be salvaged. Um, yeah, is super cool. Yeah, been working on that one for a while. <laughs> yeah, I will say, I will say though, when Lee Valley comes out with their like mini planes, I have to buy every new mini plane. Oh there. my god, I'm obsessed with tiny tools. <laughs> I have all the very just tiny tools. They're so good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I will admit that I love. Yes. Tiny <laughs> I'm like, cause they're just so cute, you know. Well, and they can do. I mean, they can get inside. Stacy actually uses. Them, I actually use. Like, I do too. I, like, I do too. I love yeah. making cabinets. I love making things with little tiny pieces that fit together. So, like, yeah, tiny tools are my jam. Exactly. Well, yeah, it was so nice to bring those uh, down for an install because it was like we're probably not going to have to do anything crazy, but like we didn't have to pack up right. a whole tool cabinet. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And tiny tools are new too. It's how you can't yeah. really find those on eBay. <laughs> yeah yes yeah i know every when they come out with new ones and my wife's like why do you need i'm like because they're cute number one okay. number two <laughs> i do use them on occasion for that like one special area that you can't get into with a bigger tool like it's perfect yeah. <laughs> like yeah. you can like stacy eventually could like build a little shop for our cats so. <laughs> <laughs> they deserve it it's true <laughs> I love it. So how long, I mean, how long have you guys been the ladies who would on Instagram? Because it didn't seem like it's been that no. long. It's been about like, a year. Was it a year, nine months? Yeah. And I mean, we, I think we started the account when we got here. Yeah. Um, so it's okay. been about a year. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, we're like, yeah, and now just like, what, 15 months out of grad school at this point. Yeah. And yeah. So and it was really just a test. We we're like, I don't know if this is a thing, if anybody's going to be interested. In yeah. I mean, we knew we wanted to work together. Like we spent enough time talking about that, but we were like, do we need a brand? Is that, is that a thing? I don't know. Let's do it and see what happens. Um, so yeah. And then we just thought it was funny and we were like, okay, if we ever made like merch, we could do some, well, I can't draw. I'm terrible at that, but Eleanor can draw. So we were thinking about, you know, funny, like Victorian ladies with 
hand, you know, power you tools or whatever. Oh, uh, yeah, let me make this one. <laughs> So this one is inspired by the old maxi pad commercial commercials that oh, say nice. wings. I love it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It was also like when we first got here and we didn't really have shop access yet or anything. It was a good way for us to waste time, I guess. <laughs> it was productive. Yeah. Yeah, we had all these plans to go to Philly for Pride and like yeah. have little ladies who would pins and yeah. spread the word. Or but, Furniture Society yeah. before it was canceled again. Yeah. Yeah. So I yeah. know we're still like we our closest friend from uh grad school. from grad school is a painter and we keep being like, come out and work with us. Um <laughs> she's just like, no, I have my life in Milwaukee and it's great. And we're like, no. <laughs> tiny little town um, with nobody here and hang out with us yeah um yeah i mean i think we're really open to collaborators especially because we know like yeah we work well together we can work well with other people and, mm -hmm. well we just get so much out of it yeah and you don't have to be someone who can do everything if you're willing to work with people who inspire you yeah, yeah. well and i think we've realized that we're not like yeah we both specialize quite a bit we specialize in different a things. lot and yeah and we're not masters of one trade yeah. by any is there a line of work like that you're planning to start tackling next you know you're going after kind of these thoughts of yeah like, erased I mean, femininity type thing is that <laughs> gonna... I mean that's something that will continue like the we're still trying to work out the wallpaper piece because it's just so complicated and at this point um as it exists in our minds it's just a beast it's too big. Well, too yeah, we heavy. don't want to move with it. We want to yeah. be like settled. Because we know we're moving in a year. But um, no, we also, we were thinking about this whole daytime delight idea and the, the way that women, the way that women's time is considered to be kind of flippantly used. And so we wanted to, we're, <laughs> we're working on these like uh, basically Victorian furniture that's actually like sex machines. <laughs> oh, dear Lord. <laughs> Yeah, so that's the next big thing. And also, if you look at Victorian workout stuff, like workout machines, they're just amazing and bizarre. And so, yeah, we thought it'd be really funny to make a bunch of like sex furniture. Um, yeah. So that's that's coming up. Well, we just wanted something too that was like a little more lighthearted than yeah. like this like kind of attack on not attack, but An attack on historical craft, yeah, attack which on we love craft, also. We're like, but... we're, we're making the things that are celebrating the beautiful things that have been made yeah. by a whole bunch of dudes in the past. Yeah. But we just need, yeah, we just needed a little breather. So we're like, I don't know, like sex toys, sex toys sound good. <laughs> sex furniture. <laughs> you, I mean, are you guys trying to get any of the other stuff you've created or is it in gallery? Yeah, it's installed in, um, in Georgetown right now in Kentucky. And then from there, I, we, I know we have a show at the end of our residency here. I mean, we would love if it were acquired by an institution so we could stop moving in places. <laughs> Just up if you, I know, uh... hey, Chipstone. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's the, the Center for Wood is right here yeah. in Philadelphia. Um, yeah, I mean, we like I have a retrospective in my parents' attic at this point. Um, we've made a lot of work that, that we still own. So I've um, abandoned most of everything Eleanor that I've ever made. Throwing away um, her work. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, ideally, it would get uh, purchased and put into a collection of some sort. And then other than that, we'll just keep trying to show it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that is the hustle I have never gotten into. And the more I hear people like yourselves talk about it, the more I'm like, mm -hmm. <laughs> it is fun. I think we also we need a deadline like if we don't yeah. have a vision coming up we are going to dawdle um yeah yeah I mean it's not like it's not not fun but it is like it's really stressful and it does end up costing you money if, if you don't get like paid by the gallery and like right yeah, there's um, stuff we just won't apply for anymore because we're like, we, we, we need to be paid for this. We're not. Yeah, and it's, or if it's like you have $25 it. to get your item here, it's like, well, that's going to cover that's nothing. That's going to be a small amount of show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But we also, I mean, at the end of the day, like every piece we make, we want to make something that is going to be fun to make, you know? And so it is really exciting. And also, everything we make, is an opportunity to learn a whole bunch of skills that we haven't learned before. You know, like the ceramics piece we just did, 
I mean, we went into it saying, can we make wood look like porcelain, like shattered porcelain? And we're like, oh no, but let's give it a shot. Yeah, we're not you really know? learning new skills. We're just making things look like other things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, it's really fun. Yeah, I mean, we learned a lot about like finishing and like the environment that it needs to be in. And yeah. like our building got really humid in the summer and it destroyed this one piece. And it was like, oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say like, I mean, are, do you use, your collaborative work to try to push some of your own skill sets or push kind of, you know, to doing something brand new? Yeah, totally. I mean, that's the thing, like as much time we spent, we've spent like in academia studying this stuff, there's so much we don't know, you know, there's so, I mean, I look at all the things that other people are making and I'm like, Although, how do they do that? You know, we're teaching carving right now. And both of us are like, are we qualified to teach this? Um, <laughs> I mean, and then we keep like being like, no, we've carved stuff we've done, before. We've we done this a lot, but we chair. did. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, everything is an opportunity. But we're, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, uh, we keep looking at like Sylvie and Sylvie is a master carver. And then it's like, oh, well, I mean, Sylvie would be better for this class. <laughs> right. But I mean, yeah, I mean, looking at Sylvie's stuff, it's like, no, I mean, Granted, I don't do hand carving. I do power carving. So it is a bit different. But still, I look at her stuff and I'm like, yeah, I can't. I Someone asked me, I did a maker event in Madison like a month ago now. And um, it was a competition thing. And I got asked to bring my stuff and bring wood. And he's like, you can carve a badger, right? I'm like, uh, no. <laughs> it does not wait what's the battery even look like is that just something in your head all the time <laughs> I, mean, I, would, I would accidentally make a beaver i'm sure of it yeah. <laughs> but i'm like i don't do realistic things just go to my instagram page i'm like it's just like blobs with like texture on it that's what i do that's mm -hmm. what i'm good at making but yeah i don't so Syl sylvie stuff blows me away every time i see a new piece she's done it just blows she's, me just she's so good at what she does yeah. There's also, I mean, when we, when I finished undergrad and we were talking about like, is it grad school next or even at halfway through grad school, we were still, still talking about how like, we just didn't have the skills to do what we wanted to do. And should we, should we like take out loans and go to North Bennett street? Should we try to go back to um, California to go to the Krenov school? And now we finally realized that we have enough to figure things out, you know, and that's all you need. Like every, everything you make is an opportunity to figure more stuff yeah. out. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's a huge, a huge lesson to finally learn and like pick up on. It took me a long time too. It was like, I lost space access to, you know, a school shop. And then I'm like, but I only have these like hand power tools. I can't make anything with these. Like there's no joiner, there's no planer, there's no, you know, all of the things I had been used to. And it just, it took a while for me to come around and realize, no, once you understand like order of operations and the general gist of like, well, why are you using a joiner? Because you're trying to get the edge and face like flat and squared to each other, right? So it's like, what else can I use to do that? Like yeah. you can figure, once you start figuring that out, that to me is where that empowerment comes because it's like, oh, I don't have to know how to use that specific tool or thingamabob I just have to have the idea of like what it's supposed to do mm -hmm. yeah yeah well and it's so easy to get up in your own head when you see some of the things that other people can make but it's like they started somewhere too <laughs> everyone well, is still yeah, building all the, the time that's the problem with like our kind of curated Instagram society right especially mm -hmm. in like now when a lot of us are still like not going out in public it's like yeah. oh there's just like not enough imperfection shown anymore yeah. or, and failures that's, or, or failure yeah, yeah. um yeah, and then you realize that like, oh no, like people screw things up all the time. <laughs> um. That is the other thing I tell people who are just getting started is I tell them, no matter what, I will guarantee you, you will F something up on a project oh, yeah. every single time. <laughs> he said, the master craftsmen are just better at hiding their mistake. That is all <laughs> that boils down to. Everybody, you it's woodworking you're gonna mess something up no project goes perfect every time yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right ladies we are at the end of our time together um so i want to give you a chance um to let people know how they should find you where they should find you and follow along with you yeah, yeah we're, uh, we're putting together a website so coming yeah. soon <laughs> uh, 
we, yeah, we use Instagram mostly yeah. to communicate with the outside world. Um, so that's at ladies who would. Um, I am at underscore or, or at off underscore artisan. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I'm at stacy.mot.art. Okay. We post different things across all three accounts. So yeah. follow them all. <laughs> <laughs> follow them all. Got it. Um, a lot of cats on Stacy. Oh, oh my god, online. do you want to know our cat account? I'm sure people know <laughs> there is one, but I won't. I won't. <laughs> when when I talk with just you, Stacy, you can let us know about that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find my cat account. <laughs> so d- will it make you sad to learn that I, I made this podcast closet to make sure my cats cannot bother me during a podcast anymore. <laughs> my favorite thing about Zoom is pet interventions. I love it. <laughs> I've got I've got one who uh, plays fetch. And so he continuously brings me something during oh. the podcast that I'm constantly like bending down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, um, thank you both for joining me today. I really enjoyed our conversation. Yeah, me yeah, too. us too. Thanks we so were much nervous. For, this yeah. is great. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah. Okay, so again, that was Stacy and Eleanor of the Lady Who Would. Who the ladies? Ladies who would. Sorry. Um, if you enjoyed this week's episode, please make sure to like, comment subscribe, especially on Apple iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, and anywhere else you get your podcast. Um, make sure to share with friends. Just a reminder, I have that goal out there of trying to hit 10,000 downloads in a month. And the only way I'm going to get there is with your help, Revolution Pod Squad. Truly, I need your help to get there. Um, and would greatly appreciate it. Hitting a number like that would just open a lot more doors. Plus, just think, 10,000 downloads in a month means 10,000 people are listening to episodes and getting to hear the stories of these fabulous makers. And that, to me, is a dream come true, is just getting all of these stories out there because each one, I hold each one precious to me. I really, truly do and feel Uh, humbled and honored that all of these women and non-binary folks have chosen to share their story with me and then therefore to share them with you. Uh, Make sure too you're following along with the podcast over on Instagram at Crafting a Revolution. That's where like all the links are held so you can get to show notes and watch it on YouTube and listen to it and all that fun stuff. So go check that out over there. When I am not doing podcast episodes, you can find me designing and making furniture and other home decor at freemanfurnishings.com and at Freeman Furnishings pretty much across all of the social media. I am active most frequently on Instagram and TikTok at Freeman Furnishings. So come on over, say hi, laugh at my hijinks, um, and let's just have a good time. All right. It is Friday. We are heading into the weekend on a very high note, I think, with the ladies who would. And uh, as always, let's go craft a revolution. She, her, them, they got something they want to say. Solution for the toxic masculinities, pollution.